We are continuing our study of the book of Luke, and this week we're continuing the study of this parable in Luke 16. Started it last week. It's the parable of this rich guy who didn't care about the poor and ended up in the flames of Hades. Delightful. And uh, uh, last week we just used it as an occasion to do a little teaching on hell. If you weren't here, I encourage you to to download the message. Uh, This week we're going to cover the whole parable. And I'm entitling this message, Acting on the Truth, uh, for reasons that I hope will become clear here rather soon. And so we're starting with verse 19, Luke 16, verse 19 through 31. It says, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. He had it going on. At his gate, which shows that he lived in a big mansion, was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. So... This guy, Lazarus, was at the the other end of the social spectrum from the rich guy. Just opposite ends here. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. Just fairly typical Jewish imagery for heaven here. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham... Have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted and you are in agony. The rich man who showed no pity to Lazarus uh, is here shown no pity. And it's sort of an application of the biblical principle that you reap what you sow. Uh, it's interesting that Lazarus uh, is, is named in this parable because it's the only time that we have uh, any character in a parable named. In fact, some folks have thought on this basis that this isn't a parable. Uh, but I think the reason why he's given a name is twofold. On the one hand, Lazarus means, the name means God helps or God comforts. And so it's it's saying that even though this man suffered tremendously in his life, uh, God comforted him in the end. Uh, Some also speculate that perhaps he's given a name because even though in his earthly life he was unknown, he he would have been one of the invisible people in society, yet by giving him a name in the parable, it's indicating that God knew him personally. Whereas the rich guy who probably everybody in the region knew, uh, he's not given a name. Uh, because he doesn't have that personal relationship with God. And then Abraham continues, and, and besides all this, he's speaking to the rich guy who's being tormented, between us and you a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. Now remember, this is a parable. If this was literally true, I think it would be nightmarish not just for the people uh, in the flames, but for the people in heaven. Because here you are, you're looking at these people being tormented in flames. You know some of them, maybe you have pity on some of them. You want to cross over and help them, uh, give them a drink of water or something, but you can't. And uh, I would think that would be as, as nightmarish and tormenting for the people in heaven as for the people in, in hell. But, but it's important to remember, as, as we said last week, that this is a parable. And in a parable, the main point is the only point you're supposed to take away. And everything else is simply a prop to make that main point. And the point of this parable is not to teach us about the, 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 the nature of, of heaven and hell, uh, but to, as we're going to see a little bit later on, to teach us a, a different point about our life here and now. And so uh, you can't read into that any kind of metaphys- metaphysical details about uh, heaven or, or hell. The tormented man uh, realizes here that there's no hope for him, and so he changes his request. Listen to this. He answered Abraham, Well, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. 
He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. The backdrop of this message is about this dialogue between uh, two folks in heaven and hell. But the main point, I think, is found in this punchline where he says, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. And I I would phrase that, uh, that, that main punchline, that main point, as it pertains to the urgency of acting on the truth that you know. The importance, the urgency of acting on the truth that you know. Pray with me here for a moment. Lord, I I just pray, God, that you would open up our ears and our eyes and our hearts and our lives to you and your spirit and your word, that it would find fertile ground. Uh, Confront us when we need to be confronted. Convict us when we need to be convicted. And build your kingdom in our life, Lord. For all who are in this auditorium or listening through podcast or through television, uh, God, just be with them. And let this word be a fiery word that pierces our heart and builds your kingdom in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. I want to give a little preface here. Uh, Remember, please remember on this message, I'm only the messenger. (laughs) Don't kill the messenger. Uh, This is one of those messages where uh, as I got into it, and it kind of grew throughout the week. It got heavy. It got hot. It's like, whoa, I saw stuff I haven't seen before. And uh, this is one that is um, confrontational. And we, we need that uh, sometimes. And I just thank you guys for loving me even when I deliver some of this hard stuff. But you just, just got to know that when I do that, I am preaching to myself as much as anybody else. So let's just, we all come under the word. And our job is to just be open to what it has to tell us. So here's this guy. I'm going to do that. He's tormented in the flames. And he wants uh, Lazarus to go and warn his five brothers, who apparently were in the same situation or lived the same kind of life as this rich guy. They hoarded their wealth and were apathetic towards the poor. They didn't share. And that's why the brother is now afraid that they're going to end up in the same spot that he is. Now, stories of of dead folks returning to the land of the living as ghosts or apparitions to give a moral teaching were fairly common in the ancient world, in the ancient Greco-Roman world. They would appear as apparitions or ghosts, and and they'd pass on kind of what they learned. Uh, It was a genre of moral teaching, a little bit like Charles Dickens' uh, Christmas Carol, where Jacob Marley comes back and warns Scrooge about uh, the fate that awaits him if he doesn't change his life. And that is just one more indication that we're dealing here not with a literal story, but with a parable. The Gospels are adopting this genre uh, and um, uh, making a point out of it. But the brother assumes that if someone from the dead were to go back and warn his brothers, then they'd repent, they'd turn, they'd change. And that seems like a pretty reasonable request. But Abraham denies it, surprisingly enough. He says, look, they have Moses. They've got the prophets. Let them listen to them. There are hundreds upon hundreds of passages in Moses and the prophets that concern the, uh, the dangers, warnings about greed, and that address the responsibility of those who have wealth to share with those who don't, uh, the responsibility that we have towards the poor. And Abraham is saying if, if all those passages in Moses and the prophets aren't enough to convince them, then they wouldn't be convinced if someone were to come back from the dead. In fact, they wouldn't be convinced even if someone rose from the dead. And here, scholars agree that he's alluding to the future resurrection of uh, Jesus, uh, alluding to his own future resurrection. And that's different than this having an apparition or a ghost appear because with a resurrection, you're there with a transformed body and the tomb is empty. And so he's saying, even if someone rose from the dead, they wouldn't listen. And it gets me wondering, why not? Why not? Seems like you know, if I saw an apparition, a ghost, and I was very, very sure that I wasn't hallucinating, I was very, very sure that I was not dreaming, I would think it would have an impact on me. If my dad you know, showed up you know, tomorrow morning, I wake up, and there he is in the bathroom waiting for me, and he goes, Greg, uh, listen, I'm here to tell you that either you change these things about your life or you're going to end up in flames. I think I'd be, imp- 